Here we go. Tēnā te mihi ki a koutou, no mai haere mai i runga te kaupapa tara nei, art, science, technology, transforming the art scene in Northland. Welcome to our creative conversation today with uh, Dr. Maggie Buxton. Uh, this is the second one of our Tech Week 2020 conversations. Maggie, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm pretty excited because it's not often I get lost with words uh, because we're about to talk about uh, new technologies and moving in ways we couldn't imagine. Uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, Dr. Maggie Buxton and Kim Newell and their arts organisation, uh, Afi World, uh, as they show audiences how art is continuously changing, uh, adapting to the current culture of the society in which we exist in, uh, and seeing science and technology incorporated in the art, which is our topic of conversation today. So this is going to be easy. This is going to be an easy conversation with, with Maggie. Uh, there will be quick Q&A and questions that are going to come through from you, uh, through, through our audience today. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear more about the project that um, Maggie and, uh, and the directors of Aki World have received some funding from Creative New Zealand uh, about the space they're working in, uh, the experiment they're doing around uh, tracing COVID-19 and exploration of some of the themes like traces and tracking and isolation and connectivity. Stuff that I kind of understand, but stuff that I don't really. Uh, I get the arts part, but I'm not sure about the science. I'm still trying to work out how my anatomy works on a clear day, but anyway. We've had a global, this global pandemic, and so this project that uh, Afi World and, um, that, and Maggie, Buck, Maggie and Kim are doing is going to be really fundamental to our communities. So on that note, Maggie, I'm just going to hand it over to you, uh, and, and you just start however you, you want. So kia ora. Um, kia ora koutou, everybody, and thank you, Hanu, as usual, um, for hosting. Um, so maybe a little bit about... Um, my background and a bit about Kim's background and Afi will to start for those who don't know about us. Um, we um, are both, I guess we both in some form um, call ourselves creative technologists. So we work in the space between creative arts and um, technology, but we use the term technology quite loosely. So it can be emerging technologies like um, augmented reality, for example, or interactive sensors and microcontroller and et cetera, or it can be technologies that involve crafting um, in its traditional sense. Um, so I um, have a, a, a long history in working in community, um, and then in about the last 15 years, moved over to working in community and I guess uh, spiritual arts practice and moved over more into technology and have a PhD in creative technologies um, from AUT um, and Kim has a master's in creative technology and has been working in the space between art, um, fine art, craft practice and tech, uh, computer coding particularly since he was about six. So he was like a really early, early person who can pick up a pen and do watercolour and also code equally as well. So um, both of us are really interested in the spaces between um, realities. So this, re this what we see here, Hinu, with you in your office and me in this, well, this is its own kind of reality, a digital kind of hybrid reality, yeah. um, uh, right through to other realities that we can't see. And so our practice involves themes like portals and parallel realities and augmented realities and various other things. So our creative practice is kind of a spiritual practice. It's a sci-fi journey and a community activation space because a lot of our work is also site specific. So we work with places to activate them and, and give them more love. And so Afi World um, is my company. Um, I started it in 2014, but had emerged out of a practice. And Afi World um, originally was formed out of a, 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 a I will call it an alternate reality game that I played in South Auckland. And so Afi World is a world that exists alongside ours that supports our world. So it's a long story of getting to the point where we're now in a place where we're very, very lucky. I know some people haven't been lucky, but we were lucky to get um, the recent funding through Creative New Zealand and the Arts Continuity Grant. And our most recent project is 
uh, looking at themes, um, interrogating themes around the, the COVID-19 crisis that we've been experiencing and translating those into an online and a physical interactive digital experience or experiences. So we're kind of researching and developing in the space around COVID, um, reactions to it, um, technologies related to it or, and or science and um, I guess conceptual themes. And you mentioned the themes, but we're particularly interested in the idea of tracing or traces, um, tracking, um, the notion of isolation and the notion of connectivity and how those things play out. Um, so that's, I guess that's the nutshell thing. Nikki, could you perhaps just explain more for our audience what is meant by tracings and, and trackings, you know, in the sense of your um, project? Yeah, I guess one of the things, I mean, there's lots of themes and I imagine some of you who are viewing it now or viewing this webinar later will think of your own themes around disruption or various other things. For us, one of the things that kept coming up as a concept was the idea of, of traces and people leaving traces, but also COVID leaving traces, like this idea of um, how we trace or track people as well is also interrelated, but not quite the same. So people becoming more aware of the tracks that they lay and the interactions that they have with one another and also what they leave behind in terms of either the virus um, or what they leave behind in terms of fear or positivity. Like it, it's kind of a very loose theme, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I guess one of the things I worked on for my PhD was GPS-based mobile phones. I use those for particular reasons to do with storytelling and, and various other things. So I know a little bit about that kind of tracking technology. And so there's a two-edged sword in being able to track and trace people um, because one becomes more surve surveilled. And so what happens is you get these environments where people were walking around our neighborhoods and they weren't just being tracked um, anyway, probably because they've got the wrong Google settings, but they're also being tracked because people are twitching their curtains to make sure whether they're in the right place they should be and dobbing them in. So there's this whole dobbing thing that happened too that was very interesting about people being tracked. So um, there's something about that idea of um, people often don't, aren't aware of how much um, at any given time they leave a trace of where they've been and how much they can be tracked by it and, and various other things. I'm rambling a bit, but you get the sense. That it's that okay. It, for me, it sounds like it's your footprint, eh? Is that what you're talking about? Traces yeah. and checking, like leaving to, your footprint in the sand sort of? Concept? Yeah, to, to some extent. It's also the virus itself leaves a footprint and we're still seeing what those what that's going to be. So we're getting more and more reports about the longer term um, ways in which this particular virus and, and the disease related diseases or conditions that come out of it, how those things leave a trace on us as well. And how will, that, how will those traces that it's left not only impact individuals, but also groups and societies? Have we already had changes in the way that we behave with one another or that the way society is set up as a result. In the industry I'm in, or we call it, I guess it's a multidisciplinary industry, we're already, we've already seen massive changes in, in organisations in the way they sell, for example. People having to go online very quickly in a way that maybe they'd have resisted before. All of those are ways in which this virus is leaving a trace longer term. Okay. Um, and economically, there's traces that are being left already. We're still, again, seeing the exponential results of that. So there's ways, there's different ways of seeing how those things happen. Mm. So what about the artistic aims? I mean, you, you're talking about traces, footprints, being able to record that. But what's the artistic aims to support your audiences that you're engaging with? What does that look like for us? Um, so I think one of the things is kind of almost to do with the the way that audiences encounter the work. Um, we're interested in developing a couple of different kinds of works which will relate to one another, but the, the main kind will be an online experience of some sort. Um, often when people think about online uh, artworks, they often think about either showing a video or um, going like a virtual tour around a gallery of existing fine arts physical works. 
Um, so, and there was a movement, I think, particularly in the early 90s, and then maybe a little bit later around web art. You know, you click on a website and see like bad stuff happen. Yeah. So we're kind of interested in furthering that kind of online interactive experience. So that it's its own, it's a work in of itself, not just what you see, but how you experience it as a whole in terms of functionality. Um, so in terms of an artistic aim, I guess you could say there's a there's a technical kind of functional aesthetic aim to kind of do that in a way that's really interesting. Um, is, this, is this beyond your usual virtual or augmented? Yeah. Sort of so, really extending yeah. the boundaries past that? Correct, yeah. So I guess in our case, um, we tend to do works that are, we tend to do works in place that are physical, in a weird way, physical digital. So we'll do project, projections, we'll do interactive installations like we have at Whangarei Art Museum. Um, and we also do um, large scale augmented reality works. We've done several phone apps where you can go around and see things that you can't see with your eyes, but using an augmented experience. So this will be fully online, but the aim is also that there'll be a physical aspect where that will relate to what happens online and that's what we're devising at the moment so it might be for example if someone walks past a certain spot or they click on a certain part of the internet something will happen in a, either a physical space or digital space so the two things will interrelate um, so for us yes it's a it's a development insofar as um, it, it's kind of a different way of of working in that that physical digital space which we like playing with um, and people think about physical digital, it is, they, are, they are kinds of realities. So there's an entirely kind of, there's an experience that's all online, there's, but you're sitting here looking at it. There's an experience of walking around with your phone. There's an experience of not having any digital at all, but maybe it's swimming around you and you can't see it. So we're, we're still playing in that same space. It's just a different constellation, I guess. Yeah, I think the words, if I remember rightly, reading one of your proposals, is you use the words creatively interweave signals, code, images, and sound into works that can be deployed. I mean, that's a really, uh, for me, was an interesting, interesting uh, concept, how you interweave signals. Perhaps you can talk a bit more about that for me. You know, what is that? Can we see it? Can we feel it? I mean, is this, are we moving into artificial intelligence? I mean, you know, that whole sort of thing, you know, making it more humanistic. Is that what you're thinking, Maggie? Um, there, I think there may be some machine learning aspects of it, depending on how one is triggered off, particularly, it depends how one interacts. We're still in the point right now, actually, of just working out some of that functionality stuff. But I think um, there will be some, I mean, at any time that you're dealing with a virus, you're dealing with um, something that exists in lots of different states and attaches to you. So even when you're dealing with a computer virus, for example, the way that that virus plays out in the, com in the computer, once it attaches to the computer, can be sometimes quite unexpected. It can damage certain files, it can do certain things, or it can create certain things. So I think for us, when we're talking about signals um, and interweaving of things, we, what we have done in quite a lot of different projects, and this is what Kim is a particular expert on, is using computer algorithms or code to create generative works. And what that means is, for example, in the plant room, you walk into the room, um, there's a signal that's sent through a sensor to the computer that picks up that you're there and picks up that you're in a certain spot. And depending on where you are in that spot, it will relay a certain image and project that image in a certain sense that's unique. So that orchid will not appear the same way each time to each person. So those algorithms or those codes or those formulas are what we're playing with at the moment. And so um, there'll be, in the case of um, both online and physical, some kind of signal that's, that is picked up and some kind of change that occurs that will create a sound or an image that's probably, at this point, we'll see it as generative, which means that it'll be something that is generated through that action. It's not like, oh, we trigger that off, therefore we're going to show this thing. It'll be this thing, but it'll be manipulated in some way, depending on the interaction. The other thing is that we've been doing a lot of research around the raw data and raw statistics behind the virus, which is kind of really fascinating. And it's not just the raw statistics, which everyone probably by now knows about, which is the, um, the way that the virus is tracked through testing or through deaths, you know, those dates or those yes. statistics. It's also the way that it impacts, for example, broadband usage 
um, transport patterns in certain months, um, consumer patterns, etc. There's an impact or a trace that one can observe um, through data um, of various ways that this has impacted us and it's evidenced, if that makes sense, through particular data. So at the moment, what we're doing is we're testing raw data, which is um, statistics around um, uh, actual people testing positive uh, and also death rates, very unfortunately, but usefully, um, to see how that, that data can be treated as a signal to then create uh, information somewhere else. I mean, wow. one of the things... Gosh, that's pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, one of the things... I mean, it's an intense thing, and I think one of the things that's really interesting as a concept is the fact that here in New Zealand, we're increasingly now kind of in this mass bubble and it's almost like its own reality where we're going about to Bunnings and this, that and the other and doing our business. And then in various other places, they're now back in or still in this extreme state of um, huge death rates, mass graves, um, and also relatedly, um, whether people like to believe it or not, a huge amount of social disruption. So we have places in Portland where we have paramilitary pulling people off the street. We have a huge amount of disruptive change happening in the world. Um, and it's, it's sometimes difficult, I think, for people to, to move out of the bubble of being in New Zealand and this island and all the things that look normal to realise that there's this extreme state occurring in other places. And so part of that is, is kind of revealing that. How do we reveal that or pull that in so that we remember that we are connected, not just isolated, which is the other theme. Whether we're in New Zealand or whether we're in Portland, we still are connected. Um, and I think that's kind of really important for me personally in terms of p political activism as well. It's remembering that it's not just us here, it's everyone together. Um, and in Brazil and, and you know some of the South American countries, South Africa, some of the scenes there are just horrific. We just we don't see that as much in our media here. It's, so some know. of your project wanting to capture some of that from what's happening in other countries, or just you know just being aware that your project actually we're not isolated. I think it's um a, I think it's a combination of both. So I think yeah. in terms of I think in terms of statistics or to, in terms of data, it's important that we that whatever data we have isn't just New Zealand based or Whangarei based, it's actually data that pulls from other places. So right. how does this, how does the, how does that data, um, how is that data from other places generating or creating form or, um, and it sounds a little bit, I don't want to sound kind of, you know, what's the word, um, overly conceptual or oblique. It's just that we're kind of in the middle of the research right at this moment. So I would normally show you something, but we're kind of at the point where we're almost about to show. So we've got some things, so we're, we're trying out stuff. But the essence of it is to bring scientific data together with um, kind of a, a I guess, a, a experimental sound and image practice and pull that through through a portal of various kinds, but particularly an online portal so people can in interact with it in a way that they wouldn't normally. So can I ask a question? So if I may, I'll just pull it back to something that you talked about earlier, which is about uh, algorithms. Um, and for our audience who are out there who may be listening is if they wanted to get a sense or an example of what you're endeavouring to achieve, you did some work at the Whangarei Art Museum, and obviously, you know, this is what you did there is kind of uh, connected to this particular project, isn't it? Because that was an interactive uh, mm -hmm. digital work that was around images of nature, uh, algorithms, uh, and you used some new hybrid forms in there, you know, which was really, really cool. Um, and, I, and one of the things, if I, did I get this right? Because part of that was sensory, wasn't it? Being able to walk into, into that space. Uh, and as by the nature of the person who walked in, it changed what was happening. So is, this some of, is that some of it? And just before yeah. Maggie answered that, I just want to reach out that if you haven't been to the Whangarei Art Museum, do go and have a look at this exhibition because we're talking about art and technology or, or creativity, if you like, and the different ways we can celebrate. In this case, the exhibition that there, which is a permanent exhibition, is about nature. But, but back to that whole thing around that sort of sensory is... Is that what you're hoping to achieve with this initiative, Maggie? Yeah, I mean, I guess the online will be a different kind of sensory because it will be an online experience only, but the physical interactive um, work will be, uh, I would imagine, in that same thing. So they'll be involved 
probably some kind of sensor that picks up or um, sees you or hears you and um, there'll be some change that occurs in the environment. That will be the similarity in terms of functionality, I think, pretty much at this point. Um, the difference will be that, I guess it is nature-based, but it's a different kind of nature, right? So it's not pretty flowers, per se. <laughs> it's a kind of different sure. nature. Yeah. Um, and, and so um, so it's kind of um, getting a sense of what that, I think a bit, a bit for us at the moment, it's getting a sense of what that visual and probably the sound stuff we've already taken care of, but what that visual stuff will be like. Um, we did quite a lot of research into um, images and of actual images and also illustrations of, of the virus itself and how that yeah. interacts, um, which is kind of fascinating in a, a world, fascinating world in of itself. Um, you know, there's a whole weird, interesting culture that's emerged out of it to do with makeables and instructables and artistic works. Like it's kind of generated its own horrible dark scene, you know, like it's kind of a thing. And some of that also just a huge amount of innovation um, and collaboration with people um, creating solutions in the first instance, particularly around um, respiration type stuff and, and masks and, and, um, and how to get people um, PPE um, right through to DIY um, prototypes for respirators in hospitals. I don't know if those have been passed by the FDA, but certainly there's been a huge amount of experimentation because obviously it took people very quickly um, by surprise and was extremely disruptive and people had to find solutions quite quickly. And so not only in the medical field, um, just trying to figure out how to lay patients the right way so they were breathing, like, you know, traditional methods, where they, then they realized they could just prop them up slightly and that was better than putting them on a ventilator. Like, there was a whole bunch of stuff that just happened very interestingly. Wow. Um, and, and it's still emerging and that kind of environment, whether we like it or not, is very dynamic and has a great deal of opportunity in it, as well as all the really horrible, um, sad and tragic elements of it. it. It forces people who wouldn't normally collaborate together to collaborate, but also brings out the people who don't collaborate with, well, who want to see shipments of PPE on the tarmac, for example, and you know, various other yeah. things. I mean, that, that's a good point because it kind of leads into my que a question. The next question is that you talk about this project around sustaining the particip participating artists over the coming months um, in future work. So <clears throat> how does that work with this project that you're doing? How will, how will it sustain? Ah, so I think that was particularly to do with um, the criteria for the project or the funding. And those who did get funding will know um, part of it was that how will the work, how will that sustain us as artists? So in terms of Afi World, I mean, we had um, things cancel and things postpone, just like a lot of other people who have site specific or event based work. So in our case, um, the funding is, is kind of a research and development project for us, sustaining us, but at the end result will be a work in of itself anyway. Um, but so yeah, I think that the sustaining thing is probably more about how does that sustain us as Northland artists and our practice. Um, certainly, um, both of us have learned a huge amount um, already just from working on that. Kim's doing a bunch of experimentation around um, certain things that he wouldn't have otherwise, if that makes sense, and 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 me also. Um, around some of that raw data thing, like it, it's actually been really useful as a as a upskilling project for us at the very least. So it means that going forward, there'll be a bunch of other projects we do, which we may not get funding for, but we have the knowledge now to do, um, yeah. including functionality. Um, and also just a lot of research into how people um, do work online has been really, really helpful. Um, because also I have another hat where I'm the co-chair of Ada Aotearoa, um, Aotearoa Digital Arts, which is a national digital arts organisation. And so that's essentially what that organisation does. So there's some crossovers to think about how other artists can do things online. They don't need to de be dependent, for example, on a venue or a physical site. Um, how do we become more flexible and agile in our practice? Um, and, and I guess in terms of fine artists or traditional artists who work in physical mediums, how do they engage with the public in creative ways that isn't just showing a picture or taking a picture and putting it online, like how can they 
how can they do things that are a bit more creative with their work? And uh, those discussions are happening all in our network at the moment, or particularly, I think, in the theatre industry, which has almost been the worst hit. You know, the, um, everyone is thinking, how do, we, how do we still make, how do we still devise, how do we still show work in an uncertain environment? Um, yeah, I, mean, I would say a lot of colleagues overseas, particularly question. in that case. Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, I suppose that's about. I mean, part of your priorities around about investigating, isn't it, and testing that accessibility uh, of of arts and how you can access it on different devices and different environments. So, um, because that's our biggest challenge at the moment for many of our performing spaces, and it's wonderful to see what's happening online. But in relation to your project, that though. Can you tell me what accessibility looks like, you know, in the sense? What are you expecting audiences to perceive? Um, well, I, can, I think accessibility has lots of different ways of thinking about it. I mean, obviously, we also need to think about people who are accessing it who don't have, um, who are maybe have hearing impairment or visual impairment. So there's accessibility in terms of that. There's also, excuse me, um, Afi World prides itself on being quite um, accessible in terms of concept. So what I mean by that is you can go to the plant room and you don't need a fine arts degree and you don't need to stand there for 15 minutes trying to figure out what the theme is. You can just kind of enjoy it on its own terms. Yeah. If you look down another layer, then you realise that there's quite a lot of themes involved to do with the environment and how we impact our environment. And then another layer down is about, um, about making and about um, people being able to do stuff um, access stuff and there's another layer down which is quite spiritual which is about connecting Whangarei Arts Museum to the community because it's so hidden which is kind of a political agenda and then there's another layer down which is about bringing nature into town through these strange little portals that we create to Kelpa Park and Laurie Hall and etc so there's like a 10 different layers but if you want to you can just come in and go oh that's shiny <laughs> Ooh, my okay. kid does a dance in here and my kid <laughs> loves the shiny flowers that's completely fine and for, we don't have any judgment about that we like take our work on its own terms because actually fundamentally it's about a site specific work where people go in and have an experience in that place and in our practice we're like wow that's awesome they came to that place connected with it and they may not have otherwise done that and so whatever way you connect with it even if you hate it it's great because you came there and you connected so for us accessibility then also means that it's accessible on an intellectual and spiritual level to the level that you want it to be so yeah. we're, we're kind of working on that process but I, I kind of pride myself on the fact that we're not um, an extremely sort of conceptually based fine arts um, digital arts organisation, you can come in and, and experience it on your own terms. And But we do have those layers there if you look for them. And that, for me, is more interesting. So that's, for me, another form of accessibility. That's cool. I mean, I suppose that comes back to the fact that you're mapping the effects, aren't you, of changes uh, on audience development and uh, building some innovative practices. But I suppose, I mean, one of the things that makes me think about, so as you're doing that, have you got any, can you share with us or perhaps just give us a little bit of insight or perhaps what are those new tools or forms that, you, that you've come across so far from your research that we might have an insight into what we might be able to visually see online? Are you um, able to share as yet? Uh, <laughs> um, well, that's, that's a, yeah, actually, Kim would probably be better for that. and He's hiding in the shed at the moment, um, <laughs> doing, doing fiddly things with tools. Um, I think Kim's been very keen on working with, um, I guess, um, systems that learn for themselves, like they kind of um, have their own, I guess, machine learning. So they, they pick something up and then turn and then change and so adapt as a result, a little bit like viruses do. So he's been doing quite a lot of thinking in that kind of machine learning, I guess, moving into that kind of artificial intelligence area and how that plays out. Um, and I guess also, it's also that kind of, there's a little element of it that particularly in the physical work that we're working on that's to do with that um, things talking to one another. So the internet of things idea. And so um, anyway, we live in an environment where even if we walk into downtown Whangarei, we we're walking around signals and code, but we don't realize it. So yeah. 
we walk across, um, how many times the intersection gets triggered off is measured. Um, there's water, quite intensive water measuring um, digital instruments everywhere. We've got satellites above us. Most people, unless they're quite savvy, are being tracked everywhere on their phones. Um, their phones are constantly sending signals to themselves and other phones and companies, which is reading data about every shop you go in. Um, you use a loyalty card. Every time you use a loyalty card, you're tracked and traced and your data is stored up somewhere. Most of the time, the amount of data we give to the companies for those cards is 2,000 times more than we get back in our points. So, uh, you know, so even in any environment, there's always things, but also in that environment, things talk to one another and have their own relationships. So the um, if POS machines all talk to the, 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 the key hub where that data feeds in, our phones all talk somewhere else. All of the infrastructure that involves any kind of um, tracking of, of car movements talks to some. They all have their own relationships. And so often I think humans are kind of entrained to think that we're kind of the head of the world. You know what, we're like the species A and that everything is like we're like, uh, the puppet master and everything occurs around us. Increasingly, we are very much um, and always have been actually part of a very complex ecology, which now involves code and signals much more clearly as part of that. In any way, plants give out signals, animals give out, everything's always signaling. I guess what I'm particularly talking about is, for example, digital signals being sent from one object to another. And so, um, even when you use your tote, you know, if you've got a, a house that's relatively new, you'll tend to have lots of objects talking to your meter box, which talks to all the house, <laughs> right? And they all yeah. have their own conversations with each other. We don't even know about it except until we get our bill or we happen to be savvy enough to have an app tracker to see whether we use a lot of power tonight. So um, I think that, again, it's like a form of traces and tracking how, we're, how things interrelate. So in terms of that emerging, it's not a new technology, Hanu, but I think that that kind of um, ecology of things, as I call it, rather than internet of things idea, particularly involving digital stuff is very interesting. And the plant room is already an example of that. You go in and we've gone to a park and we've gazet taken pictures of physical objects, we've brought them in and now through an algorithm, they're now in a digital state with sound generated and you walk in and that room is one part of a bigger room in Wham and one part of a bigger room in the town which relates back to the park and they're all talking to one another but you wouldn't necessarily see it when you go in there. No I mean <clears throat> that's right yeah I, I get that actually I was gonna say oh, that's right I get that eh? because these become so much part of our life isn't it I mean just with COVID itself with the Q&R codes of business given to track you know still tracking uh, for COVID um, and Gone are the days of the piece of paper where you kind of, well, the piece of paper is still there, but this is, this is here. You're right. In our household, we can probably think of several things that are talking to each other, as you've explained. Uh, and yes, we do. I have an app on my phone to track my power. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. do. You know, I have, a, <laughs> I have a cousin who has an app that can track his CCTV cameras. You know, if someone walks up to his front door. Yeah, yeah. That's a good example, actually. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, you know. those are very obvious. There's loads and loads and loads of different ones. The amount of things and ways in which we're watched or watch others is amazing. Um, but even just as I said, um, the virus particularly triggers us off into being more conscious of other people's behaviour as well. So that's a, its own form of surveillance. Um, as I said before, like, you know, you walk down the wrong street and everyone's bringing up the police to say that you've gone out the wrong way or whatever it was. And so um, where does that get peeled back is my wondering. Like what, what remains of that? Like in a year's time what, or two years time, we would hope still we'd be looking back on this and going, okay, well, that's interesting. Because the last, you know, one of the, one other major disaster we had, you know, the 9-11 the disaster or, or a terrorist attack as it occurred, um, that had far-reaching impacts still today around um, laws around terrorism, around the way we travel internationally. Um, so what is the impact of this going forward is my next question. What, what, yeah. will be the, what will be the traces we look back on in 10 years' time to see how this left us? Um, did we do business differently? Did we still do business at all? 
I mean, I don't know how many people are watching who know someone who's now divorced or married or, or retired as a result of being in lockdown. So, <laughs> you know, like there's, there's all these impacts um, and sometimes art is, um, its place is just to kind of remind people or be a witness to that so that we're not just in it like goldfish. We can step back and go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't notice that at the time, but I, now I see that or something. So as one of the outcomes of your project, whatever the, um, the tools or resources that you may share online and the experiences, is that one of the outcomes that you want to be able to achieve? I think so. I mean, for me, um, all of our practice involves some degree of making people more conscious of something they weren't of before. Um, mm. And that's, mm. and that's idealistic because as I said before, it's also great for people to just go, Oh, I love that projection you did on the library. That was awesome. <laughs> or I heard that whale song outside the library. Um, and I was like, wow, now I know that was a project, you know, like, um, so that's okay. But it's also, it's making people conscious of the spaces that they're in, even on a very subtle level. Um, so if there's a way we can make them conscious of the space, and I use it conceptually, um, this COVID space, if we want to use it that, in some way, that would be great. I mean, I do have a particular interest in getting, making sure people stay connected to those other parts of the world that they might not be aware of at the moment. Um, and, and there's kind of a underlying spiritual practice of, of being aware of other people's suffering, not just, not just conscious of one's own perfect world, if that makes mm. sense. Um, and yeah. Let me bring it back though to how, to our conversation though, around science and technology and transforming the art scene within mm. Northland though, this is around connectivity that you're talking about, connectivity within our own region, connectivity to our country and to other countries. But there's also to that level of, and I suppose it brings me back to my little pet subject at the moment, which I feel that there's a component of here, is back to AI, artificial intelligence. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm back to that again. Okay. Because you know, one of the four, because you know, one of the elements of it of artificial intelligence is around self-awareness, isn't it? And you're talking a lot about self-awareness, I think. Am I am I getting that wrong? Uh, within the conversation and self-awareness when you talk about art transforming the art scene self-awareness in, in our communities who have been very resilient over COVID, COVID mm. I feel we become more self-aware of our spaces our places the level of isolation we've had had and that now we are very reactive to uh, our our work and living spaces in that sense you know so AI to me becomes even more important because I don't know about you, I'm, I actually enjoyed working in lockdown. I would like to return to that level of where one has time to think, be proactive rather than reactive. But what are the tools and resources at my fingertips that enables me to be more engaged with our art scene and what we're doing, virtual tours, yes. But there's a huge amount of self-awareness there, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, for me, there's a, there's a, there's a, piece that's to do with self-awareness and if we're dealing if we're thinking about um intelligence whatever way we in, inter, interpret that we would imagine that involves learning so one can be self one can be aware but one doesn't necessarily learn as a result of that or change or grow and i think um so how do we be uh, self or other aware or systemically aware which I think are all types of awareness and grow or change or move forward or develop I think we'll use the de de develop word as a result um, because I can be aware that I've got a terrible habit of I don't know biting my nails um, but the change for me happens that's constructive is when I go, okay, so now I'm going to do something about that every time I do it. You know what I mean? So it's like that learning that happens. Okay, I, I register that this person is walking past the shop. Um, every time that person walks past the shop, I know that the smart system would then go, okay, every time that person walks past the shop, I'm now going to send them a signal that asks them to buy a pair of jeans right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can be aware that they're passing the shop, but actually the, the bit that's interesting is changing a pattern. And actually, I notice that they come in more often when I do this colour or this music, so then I'm going to make this music more. So if I go onto Spotify, um, 
you know, if I choose, or YouTube, if I choose these things in a row, or it's this time of night, I know this person likes being here at this time of the night, so therefore I'm going to make the ads longer and more annoying because I know they'll stick around longer. So all those learnings are the way that those systems kind of develop and become more functional and theoretically useful or not. So I hear what you're saying, Hu, but I think, you know, there's some people who've sprung back to the way that they necessarily were working before. Um, but there's other people who are like, okay, I've made a fundamental change now and I've developed onwards. So those for me are different kinds of awareness. One yeah. comes with a change. There's no judgment, but one comes with a change and then, a, then you might change as a result of that and then you might see that and then change as a result of that. For me, that's kind of a, I guess, a generative um, sense of learning. Yeah, yeah. And that would yeah. tend to be the way that um, most, and there's lots of different kinds of um, you know, machine-based learning or whatever you want to call it, maybe artificial intelligence, those systems, they tend to be, okay, let's watch, 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 learn, make a change, learn from that, watch, 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 make a change, learn from that. And that's how, how things develop, essentially. Um, yes. Yes, I probably moved us a little bit away from the topic, but I mean, you know, there's emerging technologies like big data robotics and, you know, and IoT, but that's a conversation for another day. I do have, though, a question that's come in around, and it's a question that's just asking, uh, what do you think, what is the next for digital technology in this space that you may bring to New Zealand? And we've talked about a number of things, but what is next? You know, I mean, one of the things that, uh, so I'm just going to add to that. So if I think about what you're doing uh, around that area of uh, chases and tracking, uh, is that whatever you present at the end of this could change the way of how we gather data, couldn't it be? You know, um, whatever the tools that you create could be uh, create new ways of uh, online infrastructure, couldn't they? You know? yeah, for example, APIs and things. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. think, um, <clears throat> I don't know that, that's a good question, whoever asked that. Um, I'm kind of in an interest, it's kind of an interesting space at the moment around emerging technology. Um, because a lot of the emerging technologies that I've been involved with since, let's say, the early, late 2000 and like 2008 onwards, are now still rel a bit, have become a bit more mainstream. Like for example, I was working in sort of that augmented reality space in New Zealand a little bit early on. And, um, and so the G and even the 3D printing stuff was around that time as well. There's a bunch of things kind of mid to late 2000s that now have come into the space. But can I say even VR, for example, tracking some of that stuff, um, but I'm kind of interested in the fact that a lot of those things still aren't very mainstream here. They aren't things that you necessarily see as ubiquitously as you would see in some of the Southeast Asian countries, for example, where AR is used much more everywhere. So yeah. I think some of those some of those technologies still have legs, but they're, they're still trying to figure out how that gets deployed. Um, in terms of the next thing, um, for me, one of those areas, and there's a few different ones, um, is definitely about systems having their own relationships and in much more sophisticated ways. So environments where we become very clearly a co-participant in the environment rather than the leading actor, for me, is probably fur becoming further along the track. Oh, can and you so give us some examples, Megan? What are you thinking? Um... I'm thinking about, for example, um, it's, hard to it's hard to describe in practice. So I guess, for example, um, you'll start seeing vehicles within about the next 10 years um, having relationships in, in terms of, you know, there'll be, um, first of all, you'll have vehicles that are um, more Mega. and more hybrid and or um, EV vehicles, yeah. um, but, but they'll also be increasingly automated. So yeah. they'll be level five, like you almost, you know, you, it, it'll be very difficult still, I think, in New Zealand to still have vehicles that are completely self-automated, but increasingly more intelligent vehicles. But those vehicles talk to other vehicles. So they'll be on the road, for example, and then there'll be systems so that the car in front and the car behind 
know and have signals sending to each other knowing how far they are away or, or having relationships with one another, or you could have um, relationships between that vehicle and consumer outlets. So when you get to a certain point, the car knows it's going to the petrol station. It's hard to describe in words, but it's, it's almost like an ecology where the, the intelligence of the things around it are having um, relationships independent of us that we really don't know about. And so we okay. live in a world where we're all part of that ecology. It, it sounds a bit out there, but it, it's, it's kind of the world we're in now, but just a, a little level along. Most of the things I think that are going to be deployed now are, are already in place. It's just that they're, they're just more things that are um, tend to be stuff that geeks, geeks do. You know, that um, home automation systems, for example. It'll be like a next level, level of that. <laughs> we, you know... Yeah. Um, I'm afraid my my mind has gone towards movies and films and uh, <laughs> thinking about uh, Star Wars and thinking about Total Recall, you know, uh, which I watched the other night and watching the difference between Total Recall 1 and then 2, you know, th there's a huge change there within the film society. Isn't it? The film of, there's a funny um, thing that happens you know. as well also that I think that we're, um, the more that we have um, this hybridity of existence between physical and what we call physical, but also digital and various other things, is the more that um, authentic experiences as people understand it become more important. So you yeah. notice, for example, at a certain point, people were talking about, um, suddenly there was like a hu huge rise in organic um, and or um, like that Hugie, that thing where you come home and you have these authentic house things with like cuddly sofas and blah, blah, blah. Um, traditional um, artisan type stuff came in at a certain point. That was all happening almost at a particular point where we had quite a lot of hybridity happening in the digital space and quite a lot of emerging tech happening. So there's yeah. always like a counter. Um, and so as much as we talk about, for example, traditional um, physical fine artists, let's say an acrylic, someone who paints in watercolours or acrylic on a surf flat surface or ceramicists and so forth, as much as we talk about the potential for those forms to um, um, integrate into, you know, 3D modelling and various other digital forms, there's also um, an important place and I think a, a reinvigoration of those forms where they become even more important to keep as they are. Yeah. And so um, going into a physical gallery actually in many cases is so much more interesting and engaging than it is to go on a virtual tour of a gallery, for example. Um, and selling those works online is not the same as, as actually seeing it in person and having a look at it. Yeah. So I think um, as much as we rush to embrace all these mad technologies and things, there's also the traditional or um, physical um, kinesthetic experience is always really important, I think particularly to humans. Um, and so we can't just imagine we're suddenly going to be in this world of flying cars and, and um, you know, that our toasters are going to ask us whether we want Marmite or not. You know, like well, here, I think, here's a thought for you. <laughs> when, you when you talk about transforming art, see, here's something for me is, is that if something was taken online in a physical, digital, interactive work, do you think that we're getting to that stage where if, if an art scene shows a breeze, we may be able to feel the breeze if we were online? Right. And I'm not talking about virtual reality either. I'm just talking about you open an app, you see an artwork, and you, you go, wow, that looks like a gorgeous breeze. Do you think you could feel the breeze? <laughs> Would that there be are ways of doing that. No? I mean, there are t ways of doing that no. now in VR, for example. You'd have to set up a system so that a, a breeze could blow or, um, or some kind of kinesthetic, kinesthetic experience on a glove or something that's similar to a breeze on your skin. But that is possible to do that. Um, I mean, Raywin Turner, I don't know if she probably won't be watching this, but if some of you know Raywin Turner, she deals in synesthesia or, or, or multi-sensory experiences. So she's done various experiences where you um, smell when you're watching things or sit in an orchestra and hear and smell and feel. She does lots of things with scent particularly, which is very fascinating to me. Um, those kinds of things are really interesting when you embed them into stuff. Um, and also, we're still learning about how the brain works and how the sense of smell relates to how we make sense of it in our mind. And so, as we become more aware of those triggers, um, which are often electrical triggers in our brain, you can, you can sometimes um, 
at least synthesize or replicate some of those things as well. So it could be possible in the future, for example, to have a fully immersive experience and imagine that you're in what you would perceive to be real, a real environment. I find that very disturbing existentially, but it is, it, is, it is theoretically possible for that to be the case. It may not be possible right now, but you could, in some ways, depending on how you do it, create an experience where people would be unsure about what is real and what is not. What, yes, what they uh, perceive to be real. I suppose reading your brief again about what you're doing around science and technology makes me think that that's where I would hope or potentially you guys may go because I see you in that space. You know, it's really pushing the boundaries, isn't it? Not saying that they occur, but just thinking of that whole thing of connectivity, you know, and as you're tracing, do you think, have you, are you seeing any of those elements coming through? Because it really pushes, pushes the boundaries, doesn't it? I mean, we're not there yet. I mean, we can see it within the movies, but it's really pushing the boundaries for me anyway. I find it quite uh, I find, um, I think, exhilarating. I mean, yeah, yeah. My, my, um, I've always steered away. From, I mean, I gave an example that's probably more of, a, like a, I call them like beat, like a virtual reality example. I'm, I'm, I've always been very wary of virtual reality. I don't like being displaced. And right. I, mean that I don't like this disembodying experiences where I kind of in my mind, but not in my physical body. So my PhD was on augmented reality and the spirit of place for that reason. Like I, I liked people standing with their feet on, on the, the ground, ground. <laughs> but then experiencing something they couldn't see with their eyes, which for me replicated real to day to day life. But we've had lots of experiences already in our practice of that thing. Like, um, I don't know if I've told the story before, but we did a an augmented reality experience involving these interdimensional creatures in Papakura, where you walked around and found these creatures everywhere, which we're going to be doing a similar thing for at a smaller scale for the Whangarei Fringe Festival in October, um, related to bugs. <laughs> I, won't, I won't talk too much about it, but we might imagine it's related okay. to the conversation today. So, um, so when we had this workshop, I had this, um, we had this giant um, thing on the floor, which when you held your phone over it, um, you could see a giant praying mantis crawling on the floor. And so we gathered all these children around and said that we'd open this portal up in this workshop and they gave them these devices and they all held it over this thing. And then this giant bug appeared and you could hear them all go, oh, miss, oh, I don't know. And this little kid, um, she must be about eight, she comes up and she goes, Miss, is that real? Is that what we're seeing? Is that real? And then we had this really fascinating discussion for about 15 minutes about ontology and the nature of real with this like eight year old. <laughs> okay. You know, what is real to you? Like you can see it. It's a thing that's in the world, but how do you know it's real? And then I think these days, um, because we have so many different experiences of what real can be. In fact, here I am, Hanu, with you here on my yep. laptop in my lounge. There's all these other people, I don't even know who's watching right now. Hello everybody who's out there, but you're there in your own lounges. Um, this is like a weird reel, right? Like we're in this weird reel, but this, this weird reel did not exist 15, 20 years ago. Years ago. Like it, it would have been in some geek's basement, sure. But <laughs> as, as ubiquitous as this, where we have this many people able to view it, this is a new reel and yeah. actually, more people are experiencing this new reel in the last three months around the planet than have ever before experienced being online with others in this way, like the in, up, uptake of things like Skype and Zoom, et cetera, et cetera, and or doing business. And that's new reel. And that's only three months. That's only just happened that we've had this degree of right. business yep. taking place. Yep. That's, but this is its own weird reality. So what do we imagine going back to the person who talk last. I think we're going to be having a reality where um, where real expands even further and becomes much more um, multiplicitous. And so we're really going to have to be thinking hard as people, who we are in terms of our identity, um, how we emplace ourselves, um, what means a lot to us, what is really important, what are our values. Because in a world where you have so many choices that you're physical, digital, spiritual, and otherwise, that you're completely imploded, it will become even more important as a human being to understand all of those questions, for me at least anyway. But that's getting very existential now. Apologies. No, 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 thanks, Meg. Yeah, I think that's good. I think for me, to, that what I'm hearing is that 
digital technologies will continue to change the way people access, produce and use cultural content. That's what you've described, eh? And uh, that's not going to change. It's just going to get, we're going to, you know, you're right, we've moved from the, from the, the, the video to the um, 3D projections to virtual reality, augmented reality. You know, there's so many things happening, but all of them require some form of cultural content. So that's really interesting, I think, uh, as we move forward. So I look forward to watching that space and seeing what elements of that may come through uh, as you, uh, you know, as you complete your project. I see we've got a couple of questions, Maggie, so I'm just going to have a quick look to see what they are uh, for us today. So, oh, here we go. So here's one from Bridget O'Rourke. Uh, Thanks for vicariously sitting in on this conversation. Would be good to further chat with you, Maggie. So uh, she looks forward to having a further conversation around synthesizing this information. Thank you, Bridget. Um, do you feel your PhD has propelled you to this art form and deeper understanding of context behind it? Or do you feel without it, you naturally would have arrived where you are? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think the... Um I don't know. I, I, 2020 existentialism is very difficult for me to look back <laughs> and decide whether or not I'd have done that. Um, it was on a trajectory of a various things where I look back and it felt like they had all lined up. And so um, what happened was in very quickly in, in 2007, six, seven, I was with an arts organization in Brussels called FOAM, F-O-A-M, for anyone who's watching, they are amazing. And I did a residency with them as part of a European Commission funded program for, would you believe it, the Guild of Reality Generators and Integrators, BRIG. It was like really? literally funded people to investigate and research reality and art forms that created and wow. generate realities. And so I was given a grant to literally investigate ultimate reality gaming as an art form, which is like a multi-platform, mind-bending reality um, play, interactive play theatre system. Um, and so anyway, I think at that point I was becoming disenchanted by the way that I was engaging with my practice as a mainstream strategic consultant and trying to find new ways to get people to self become self-aware to become systemically aware to engage with each other with kindness or at least empathy to um, see problems or solutions in new ways etc and i needed to do that differently other than flip charts and post-it notes and anyone who's watching this will know how deeply when you sit in a room and see flip charts and sharpies and post-it notes you can feel sick in your heart so I got to the point where I was like, there has to be another way to get people to think or engage differently together. And so I guess creatively I worked to find a way to do that. And foam was the catalyst for that. And then the PhD cemented it because I moved beyond alternate reality gaming into augmented reality. And because my PhD was a multidisciplinary PhD, which crossed over between anthropology, <clears throat> theology, um, computer science and human geography and education, it meant that I consolidated a, a huge amount of my career. And from that point, I was able to kind of go, okay, I can produce these things now much more easily because I'd already done a whole bunch of prototypes as part of my PhD. So would I probably be in a different space? Yes, um, but maybe who, who knows where I'd be. It feels like that's like a sci-fi movie where if I'd opened a door, <laughs> quickly, I'd be in like London now or something. But great question, thank you. <laughs> Hey Maggie, thank you. That's a really good um, place for us to, to finish. Uh, I can't believe that an hour has gone by. Uh, thank you as always. I always find it really good to talk to you. You really make my mind uh, have to think uh, <laughs> about, makes me think about stuff and I, I like that. You know, thinking differently, keeping it real. That's a good word, keeping it real, you know, with what the new norm is. Or what um, real is. Um, Hanu, yeah. just as a quick thing before yeah. we finish, just to acknowledge sure. Creative New Zealand, um, who have been funders for us, and also to sure. acknowledge my partner, Kim Muir, who's my partner in crime and in life. Um, we work really well together around this. He wasn't able to make it today, um, but, um, but you know, Kim, Kim and I work in, in a synthesis together, so it's really important that it's, he, Afi World is the way it is because of him. We do projects without him, but he's oh. there. Um, so both those things need to be acknowledged. And thank you again for inviting me. I feel like I ramp it on most of the time and sound completely strange, but some of you out there, if you got something from it, hooray, <laughs> feel free to message me. I'm happy to have weird conversations with you as well. <laughs> <laughs>
things, Maggie. So look, yes, to our audience who've been with us today, thank you for following this conversation with Dr. Maggie uh, Buxton uh, from Uffy World and with Kim Newell in Absentee. Uh, um, but it's been good to just to actually have more of a conversation about uh, about uh, science, science which I'll never, never really completely understand. Uh, and art scene I do, but I know that there's a connectivity there definitely. And with brilliant minds like you and with Maggie and with Kim, I know that we're in safe hands. So Northland, if you want to understand a bit more about what digital technology or what technology is doing, please know that Mag Maggie uh, established here Creative Technology Northland. Uh, they meet once a month. Uh, and if you want to know more information, just, just contact Creative Northern. We'll, we'll tell you how to get hold of Maggie and Uffy World for projects. They're available through the Northland and through for, for anything, really. So, uh, you know, remember that art form is, is a solution. Art mm. form is part of who we are in the everyday. But art form is not just limited to visual or performing arts. Art form is much more than that. The creative sector has around about 13 genres attached to it. And today we have only talked about a, a, a small component, but an integral component to everything we do. So on that note, thank you, Dr. Maggie Buxton. It's been a pleasure as always. And mm -hmm. I look forward to, to talking to you or having a cup of tea at another time. Kia ora. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.